Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. John Brooks about the environmental impacts of wild pigs. What do wild pigs have to do with antibiotic resistance and water quality? How does one go about studying these wild animals? What can this knowledge tell us about how to handle the wild pig problem today? Answers to all these and more coming right up. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. Today, we have John Brooks with us. John attended the University of Texas, El Paso, where he obtained a bachelor's degree in microbiology, then attended the University of Arizona to obtain his PhD in microbiology and immunology with a minor in soil, water, and environmental science. He's currently employed by USDA ARS located at Mississippi State University in the Genetics and Sustainable Agriculture Unit. Hi, John. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Abby. Uh, How are you? I am doing so good. Uh, So glad to have you on the show today. So, Today we are talking about wild pigs and their potential impacts on the environment. So just can we get a background on what what is going on with wild pigs? Why are they potentially a problem? When did this problem start? How did it start? Anything like that? Sure. Um, so th- really the problem uh, started hundreds of years ago. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, wild pigs are considered old world animals, uh, meaning that they're not native to North America. They were basically brought here by early European settlers. So then they've been around since, you know, the, the, let's say the 15 or 1600s. Uh, but then you flash forward to the 1900s and sports hunters imported uh, more European and Russian pigs. And so you started to develop this hybrid uh, pig. And so now we have uh, these wild uh, various versions, uh, varieties of wild pigs that are running around the country. And currently, uh, there's about 35 states that report wild pig populations. That population is probably north of 6 million. Um, and, and there's probably more states than that, than the 35 that are currently reporting. There's, there's probably a handful that uh, have them, but don't quite know it. Uh, in fact, there's projections going to 2050 showing that basically all states, with the exception of very far northern states, uh, will have a, a population of wild pigs. Wow, that's a lot of pigs. I didn't realize the numbers were that high. It is, it is. And and really one of the, the big problem is that wild pigs breed rapidly. Uh, in fact, they're of breeding age uh, within one year of birth. Uh, in fact, in some cases, there are there is anecdotal evidence to suggest that they can have up to two litters per year. Uh, so they certainly do breed. And so that coupled with the fact that these wild pigs, I mean, if you start to get above a 40 pound pig, you really limit your natural predators. And so uh, once you limit them, well, then there's really nothing to stop them from invading your uh, fields or if you're a farmer, uh, your, your farmland, or if you have livestock invading your, the land that you have your livestock on, there's really nothing stopping them. And so these pigs, uh, once they're, uh, they become quite invasive, they really, what they're doing is through their typical activities, they can destroy entire ecosystems, uh, of course, agricultural systems. Uh, can all be disturbed uh, just by the way they behave and and what they what they do. So we're talking cash crops can be lost, ecological niches can be destroyed, uh, just a number of things that can really be destroyed. But w- what we focused on in this particular study is is surface water contamination. Sure. Um, and then there's just uh, a couple of terms that I wanted to get covered before we launch in here. So the first one is uh, antimicrobial resistance or uh, not quite 
fully interchangeable, but also antibiotic resistance. We've talked about this on the show previously with Lisa Durso. Uh, And that's basically the idea of just anything that would make a bacteria more resistant to our efforts to fight it. And then antimicrobial has just a wider umbrella. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Antimicrobial uh, resistance or or the hot uh, phrasing AMR, uh, those are, it's, it's just a broad term. Whereas antibiotic resistance, we're really focusing in on bacteria. Uh, we're antimicrobial. You can you can have uh, fungi in there or bacteria, um, uh, but uh, uh, really the focus for antibiotic resistance is bacteria. Sure. And then uh, a, a term that's kind of related to this is you were kind of looking for um, these genes that could kind of hop from one to another. Uh, one from bacteria to bacteria. Can you kind of explain what that term is? Yeah. So what we're talking about there uh, are are mobile genetic elements, and uh, per, there's a particular gene that we looked at in this in this study uh, called class one integron, and it, it's a gene that basically helps uh, bacteria share other genes. And in this case, uh, the sharing of other genes that we're interested in are antibiotic resistant uh, genes uh, that can be shared using these uh, class one integrons. Perfect. Yeah. So just anything that makes them maybe genetically mobile would be a, a good way to put that to hop from one kind of bacteria to another. That's correct. Yeah. Anything that makes them genetically mobile. Perfect. Just want to make sure I was using the right terms so I don't... Uh... Uh, mess things up a little later. But uh, so looping back then, you were really focusing in on the environmental impacts of these pigs on water quality, specifically as it relates maybe to um, these more microbial elements. Can you kind of explain uh, what is the general research question? Yeah, so really the the initial objective of the study, um, and I'm going to pull back from the actual study itself, but the initial study was established uh, by a co-author uh, on the paper, and that's Dr. Garrett Street of Mississippi State University. And he wanted to study wild pig ecology. Uh, specifically, he was looking at pig movement and activity, uh, and he wanted to develop models uh, to estimate the probability of what that pig is doing as a function of their activity level, uh, which would ultimately help him understand uh, ecology, you know, pig ecology. So this particular study that he was establishing just so happened to be uh, near a, a waterway on our um, experimental lands here at Mississippi State. And uh, so then that really brought myself and another co-author, uh, Dr. Beth Baker of Mississippi State, uh, who happens to be a former student of mine. And, and so that brought the two of us in on, on the study, uh, which was to look at the impacts of the pigs uh, on a water quality level. And so what, what pigs tend to do is when they get hot, they tend to congregate near water sources. And in this case, we're talking about water sources, uh, surface water that ultimately uh, recharge our drinking water or, uh, for instance, feed ponds, uh, lakes, streams, and rivers that we ultimately would utilize recreationally. Uh, so as pigs cool off in these water sources, they carry fecal matter, they carry soil from all their rooting activities, and all this stuff, uh, the, the, the fecal matter and the soil, will contaminate uh, the water source. And in this case, we're talking about, for this particular study, uh, macronutrients, uh, as well as pathogenic bacteria, and in our very specific study, antimicrobial resistance. So then moving on into, now that we know what you were hoping to look for, starting maybe from the beginning here, how exactly were you hoping to go about testing these things? So really the, the key portion of the study and really the, the building block of the study was capturing of these pigs. Um, so what Dr. Street and his team did was they went out and captured pigs. They captured pigs throughout Mississippi um, and, and they transported them back here to uh, the campus to, to set up the, the paddock, if you will, 
this is where we we had the pigs, uh, and it was about two and a half acres in size, and it was it was partially in a wooded area and about. Uh, uh, 90 feet away from the nearest water source, which in this case was Turkey Creek uh, on, on Mississippi State's uh, South Farm. And how does one go about catching wild pigs? Yeah, so so th- these these wildlife ecologists, I, I think that they're kind of nuts. Uh, you know, they go about uh, uh, doing these captures. It's kind of like what you see on TV with with uh, I don't I can't think of uh, the person's name, but the, that uh, that hunter or, or wildlife ecologist uh, the, that was killed by the stingray. Um, Steve oh, Irwin. Steve Irwin. Steve Irwin. Yeah, uh, they're kind of like that guy. They're I think they're just kind of nuts. But what they what they did is they basically set up these they call them corral traps, and and basically they're just large corrals that are circular uh, in nature, and uh, you have a trap door on it. So there's one way in and one way out, and you have a trap door, and that trap door is controlled and monitored by a camera, and that camera. Uh, is is uh, uh, connected to a cellular uh, service, and basically the the team in this case uh, Garrett Street, uh, Jane Dentinger, Clay Gibson, and Dr. Bronson Strickland of Mississippi State University, they would wait by their phones, oftentimes at three in the morning, because like I said, pigs these pigs move around early in the morning and at at uh, uh, late at night. And so they would wait by their phones at three in the morning and the camera would would go off. And when the camera would go off, it would show a picture of what's going on in front of that corral trap. And they would then get a chance to look and see that, okay, we have uh, the number of pigs that we want, or let's just make sure there's no bear in there or something odd like that. Uh, so they would, uh, once they saw what they wanted to see, uh, they would then trigger the trap door which would then close. Uh, and, and then once they close, then the team would mobilize and drive out to the location and uh, sedate the pigs and, and bring them back to the experimental site. Gosh, that is wild. <laughs> yeah, like I said, they're crazy. <laughs> yeah, I just immediately go to like a very like superhero, like the bat signal, <laughs> like there's a pig, we have to go now. Um, which I mean, obviously you do because you don't want to just leave them in there for you know until you it's convenient to go. Um, how how big are these animals that they were capturing for this study? I know you mentioned you know a forty pound pig, but they get a lot bigger than that, as I understand. Is that correct? Oh yes, absolutely. They are are much bigger than that. We're talking hundreds of pounds uh, <laughs> uh, for a pig. Yeah, yeah. These guys. There are some of the pigs. Um, uh, in some of our pictures that you can tell they're they're quite large wow that's crazy i mean that sounds dangerous to i mean to sedate them and get them transported and stuff like that uh and then i know you had a certain you know you mentioned wanting a certain quantity of pigs for your study how many did you end up having in this area so for uh, the ones that actually got transported uh to the location initially we started out with four um, and, and that was just, it happened to be that four was captured uh, within that, that uh, particular night. Um, but we then, the study varied from two to 13 at a time. And, and that was really due to birth, more pig trappings. In fact, we trapped pigs, uh, the team trapped pigs uh, three times total throughout the study uh, period. And then um, unfortunately, some mortality. You know, the pigs do get under stress when they're under their um, in, in these corral traps and, and uh, do get under stress where when they get transported so that there unfortunately is some mortality. Did you ever go pig pig trapping at all or were you like, I'm, I'm good? Yeah, no, I, I am a microbiologist and by nature, I'm a fairly big wimp. So, um, <laughs> yeah, we, we don't uh, leave our, our little labs. I mean, I'm an environmental microbiologist, so I do go to the field quite a bit. Uh, but, uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, the most dangerous things I like to work with are, you know, one, uh, millionth or one billionth, uh, my size. Fair. I mean, still dangerous depending on what you're working on, but, uh, fair. Uh, I don't know that I would be very useful on a pig trapping hunt, uh, myself, 
But that's really uh, great. So you, you basically, once you went out and caught all of your pigs, um, safely got them into your working environment, how did you go about testing and monitoring uh, for these elements that you were hunting for? So, like I said, we, we had a, a paddock uh, that was about two and a half acres in size um, and, and located near a water source. Uh, now, it's important that we did not want them to access the water source directly because then in that case, we're contributing to the potential contamination downstream. Uh, so, so we made sure that they didn't have access directly to that particular water source. Uh, but what we ended up doing is, is we placed runoff collectors above and below the paddock. If you can imagine, the paddock is, has got an incline kind of on a hill. Uh, so there, there's a, an incline that's going downhill, and so you can place runoff collectors above it and below it. Uh, and then we went ahead and, and placed sample locations uh, within the paddock itself to sample soil, uh, to sample soil outside of the paddock, and then of course collecting water from the creek itself, both upstream and downstream of the location. And basically, we waited for uh, large rain events. In this case, I believe we had a little over 20. Uh, large-scale rain events that generated enough runoff for the study uh, during the nine months of the of the study, and and we would collect samples from from all those locations th throughout that time. Sure, and then you just tested them for the fecal bacteria, those uh, genetically mobile elements, that kind of thing that you were looking for. Yes, that's correct. Uh, yes, so we we tested for nitrogen and phosphorus uh, compounds in the water. Uh, we tested for, on the bacterial side, we looked for uh, these fecal indicator bacteria, uh, bacterial pathogens, uh, ones that, I can, that can actually make you sick, and of course, uh, antibiotic resistance uh, of these pathogens, as well as uh, DNA, like what we're talking about with the mobile genetic elements, and also antibiotic resistant genes as well. <music> everyone, I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? John's article, A Preliminary Investigation of Wild Pig, Suscrofa, Impacts on Water Quality, published in the Journal of Environmental Quality, will be freely available for the next two weeks. You can find a link to it in our show notes. If you are a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, you can also take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Let's get back to the show. And what did you find? So basically what we found is that with the pigs, um, they certainly can contribute uh, to water quality degradation. Um, we're, we're well aware of this. And what we found was that uh, the pigs can contribute to increased uh, release of nitrogen. And so that's an issue uh, because that, you know, as you release nitrogen into the environment, uh, into water sources, um, you can certainly start to degrade those sources um, uh, uh, through a process called eutrophication. And that process uh, basically uh, through the overgrowth of algae, uh, you you basically get rid of uh, the oxygen in the lower depths of that water source. And so, of course, it kills fish and it kills all kinds of uh, ecological um, uh, niches in, in those water sources. So you don't want nitrogen or phosphorus running into uh, your water sources. And But we did find that the pigs do contribute to this release of, of nitrogen. Uh, but, and we also found that, of course, the pigs do release pathogens. Uh, in this case, we found that they released uh, uh, Campylobacter, uh, as well as fecal indicator bacteria uh, uh, into uh, water. And, and really, this was focused mainly on uh, the runoff that we collected. So the, the water that was, that was fairly close to where the pigs were located uh, this is where we really were able to find the most of our significant results. Uh, we were also able to find uh, uh, some of these mobile genetic uh, elements as well uh, released by the pigs. So obviously, uh, this is a, a fairly far-reaching 
problem if it's in this many states with, you know, six million plus populations. And I think uh, part of why we wanted to to pick this topic for our show is because I think there are a lot of people who are aware that this is a problem, not just in the United States, but even in other countries, you know, they have similar problems with pigs or, you know, might be aware of of the issues here. So what what does this research uh, mean for this conversation as we're talking about, you know, how are we going to handle this problem? To what degree, you know, do we need to handle the problem? Anything like that? Uh, what are kind of the implications, not just for, uh, I guess we can maybe chunk it out into, you know, landowners who might have either farmland or, or other land that could be affected uh, general public, public health, any of those areas, uh, what does this research tell us? So really the biggest issue right now with, with pigs, wild pigs, is, of course, their proliferation um, and their movement. Uh, there, are, there are studies or, and, and uh, data out there, uh, particularly uh, USDA APHIS has uh, uh, data showing wild pig movement starting kind of in Texas and, and the southeast and in, in the early 80s and moving just west, north, east, um, and, and just moving to the northeast, uh, showing their movement. And, and really, that's the biggest issue right now with these pigs. So while this study does not address of, uh, you know, trying to find ways to get rid of the pigs or trying to find ways to keep them from moving. But what we did find out is is really how what their extent of their problem uh, could be environmentally. Um, we were always aware that they they had pathogens. Pigs carry forty five different parasites uh, in, in their in their systems, and so we're aware that they have pathogens that pose a threat uh, to to us, but also to livestock and even our companion uh, uh, animals as well. So uh, we were aware of these things. But one thing that the study really looked at uh, that was unique was this antibiotic resistance uh, aspect of it. And, and this is just really a new area that we're focusing in on uh, uh, for wild pigs in this case, because uh, it's just showing that there's another potential source for antibiotic resistance in the environment. Uh, one of the issues with antibiotic resistance is that we're, as, as a community, we're looking for genes or bacteria that we can use to monitor human impacts on the environment. And one of the genes that we, that we looked at, this mobile genetic element, uh, is one of those genes that we're, uh, as a community, we're trying to use it uh, to monitor human impacts. And so really finding another environmental source, in this case, wild pigs, uh, is important because that really helps us understand uh, that there's an overall background uh, for this gene, uh, because it, really that's going to be our measure for determining the impact that uh, we may have on, on the environmental antibiotic resistance. So that's really uh, some of the big implications here. Sure. So kind of adding some urgency maybe to uh, the conversation or, or some better, broader context for the conversation. Um, when you say that uh, we're kind of looking for the human impact um, and then seeing that in the pigs, do you mean that that's something that is moving from humans to the pigs or like they're both potential sources and so now we need to kind of suss out where it's coming from when we do find it. Yeah, so really we're fully aware that uh, these wild pigs are moving all across the land, right? So as they're moving, they can easily cross into a concentrated animal feeding operation that has livestock. Um, maybe they have poultry, maybe they have uh, other pigs, maybe they have uh, dairy cows. And as you have uh, these pigs crossing into those territories, they can mix their bacteria with the bacteria of whatever livestock it is that's on that land. And when you have these mixings, 
Uh, of, of course, you can share genes, uh, like we were talking about this uh, mobile genetic element. Uh, you can share genes. Uh, you can uh, share bacteria. And so those implications are, are pretty big in, in that case, that we have the potential to have this source of, of bacteria in wild pigs that, that becomes quite mobile because they themselves are quite mobile. Sure, sure. So then uh, what would be areas of future research moving forward now that we've got uh, maybe a baseline acknowledgement that this can be an issue? Where do we go from here? So right now, uh, Dr. Street uh, and his crew, uh, they have some papers in the works uh, from the study, uh, particularly looking at uh, developing those models uh, from their pig movement data. It's, it's really looking at the way pigs, um, uh, with their activity level, and, and using that to determine what they're up to uh, on a on a 24-hour basis. Uh, so he's got some papers coming out from that. Uh, but on the environmental side, this study was so unique and in in a way difficult to pull off because of the capturing of the pigs, the housing of the pigs. Uh, so we're not going to do anything else with captured pigs, at, at least at this point in time. But uh, we are looking at full-fledged field studies uh, from discussions I've had with some uh, wildlife colleagues, uh, particularly focusing in on not only wild pigs, but on other uh, on, on native wild animals. Uh, and I'm interested in it from their potential contributions uh, towards environmental antibiotic uh, resistance. Yeah, that's those are great areas for research. So I have three questions left for you. If people want to learn more about this topic or this research, what would be maybe kind of one key source that they could go to for that information? Yeah, so uh, my colleagues at Mississippi State University, they have a uh, wild pig information uh, webpage. And I think that's probably uh, the best source. Uh, and it's it's wildpiginfo.msstate.edu. Uh, and, and there you can find quite a bit of information about wild pigs, actually. Um, it, it's There's quite a few links uh, embedded in that, that that really can give you a lot of information about, about the issue and about the problems. Yeah. And uh, if you have additional resources, we are going to include those in the show notes. So please, folks, check those out. Uh, second question for you, if people want to then kind of take the next step and maybe get involved with this research, this problem, anything related to that, um, what are what are some ways that people can help address or alleviate this issue? Well, like we talked about earlier, these pigs are so mobile. And so, and they're proliferating, they're moving quickly throughout the, uh, the country. So if one farmer protects their land, uh, it may work well for his or her land, but the pigs are just going to move to another site. Uh, so one thing is, is, is really for landowners to, to band together, um, you know, talk to your fellow landowner uh, to maybe form a contingency and, and figure out a way to best deal with these pigs. Of course, talking to your uh, county extension agents or your university extension uh, extension personnel, uh, they will certainly help you find ways to to deal with the pigs. Um, but really, you know, for the public at large, it's not really an issue because it's it's sort of happening in the background. We don't. You know, the public at large, we don't really pay attention to what's happening with agriculture. And so, of course, one way to uh, support uh, this type of public research at the university and federal levels like myself, uh, uh, like with us at ARS, is, is always um, uh, to get involved. Uh, there's probably an ARS uh, location, a USDA ARS location within 50 miles of, of your home. Uh, and they're all doing good work and specific work tied to your locale or to your region. And, and you can, of course, uh, support them by contacting, uh, you know, your representative and asking, asking them how you can support uh, uh, research in, in USDA. Sure. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, speaking of ways that, that landowners can kind of band together, I wanted to ask, what are some ways that you can 
as a landowner, maybe protect your land, or um, I think you had mentioned in the paper, maybe, you know, putting buffers around water, or what are what are some of the efforts that landowners can do to mitigate some of the potential threats from these bacteria and such? Well, so the, the buffers, uh, that works really for any sort of runoff event. Uh, so in this case, we had a riparian buffer uh, vegetation uh, buffer that uh, protected uh, the water source from the pigs. And, and those buffers act by, since they're vegetation, they act by basically providing more surface area for uh, rainwater, runoff water that could be carrying fecal matter uh, or soil sediment. Uh, it, it provides more surface area to kind of allow these things to grab onto. And, and get trapped in the vegetation. So of course, protecting, if you're a farm uh, or landowner and you've got some sort of um, uh, creek or stream, well, every creek and every stream eventually feeds a river and eventually that river feeds into the ocean. And so if you wanna protect those surface waterways, um, uh, you know, of course, riparian buffers are your best uh, bet uh, or grass buffers. Uh, are, are your best bet for protecting them. But protecting against pigs, um, you know, most farmers now, when they do come up with a, a plan, th there's options out there for, you know, sterile, there's, there's research out there for sterilization techniques. Uh, but uh, right now, probably the, the most ethical, humane approach uh, is, is unfortunately trapping the pigs and, and euthanizing them. Um, that is pretty much the approach that that's being utilized right now. Sure. Are they, uh, if you put up like a fence, are they going to just try and push their way through? I mean, are they pretty gung ho for really getting at, you know, if they see a crop that they want, are they going to be aggressive enough to kind of break through things or are they just like, nah, I'll just go somewhere else? No, no, they, well, if they get stressed enough, uh, they will absolutely uh, break down through a fence. Um, if you get a, a 200 pound uh, pig uh, running at full speed, it's, it's like a linebacker in the NFL uh, running at full speed. I mean, they're going to break down, uh, and, you know, generally speaking, any of the fences you might have up. Uh, so, so they can do that. Um, they, you know, may uh, uh, not be interested. It depends on what's on the other side. You know, what could be attracting them uh, for them to actually want to uh, get through that fence. But certainly, if they're stressed and they're spooked, uh, they they certainly will do it. Wow, <laughs> I'm not I'm not surprised by that, but it's uh, still impressive. Uh, okay, I kind of cheated and snuck in two extra questions, but last question until I come up with more. Uh, what is one fun fact for you that people would not know about if all they had was your research? Um, well, I mean, I guess, uh, and I don't know how fun it is, but um, uh, I'm a big sci-fi nerd, um, and I, I love to run and cook, and uh, I enjoy spending time with my wife and, and, and my furry children. So, um, you know, I don't know how fun those, those facts are, but, uh, yeah, that, that would be me. Those all sound very fun. Uh, giant sci-fi nerd over here. So I feel <laughs> you. Um, tell, uh, I, I need to know about the, the furry children <laughs> now that it's been brought up. Uh, if you would like to share more about those, I would definitely receive that information. <laughs> Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm a big dog person, and 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 a, and even a cat person, uh, and so I've I've pretty much always had dogs and cats uh, ever since I you know since I was born, and so now at the moment the Brooks household has a, a beagle, a 17 year old beagle, and a two year old uh, something, some sort of mix of something. Um, and then a cat, uh, a nice little uh, uh, seven-year-old cat. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it makes for fun days, especially especially the uh, the two-year-old uh, uh, dog. She's still very much a puppy, and uh, quite exhausting. Yeah, wow, that's a broad range of ages for you. Um, 
keeps for a busy household, I'm sure. It does. Uh, the 17 year old is, is, uh, he's fun. Uh, he wakes me up at four in the morning on the dot every morning. Doesn't matter what day it is, uh, of course, to, to let him out and go to the restroom. Um, so yeah, that, that always makes for a fun morning, especially when you're sick with something or, you know, you've got the flu or something like that. And, you're having to take your dog out at uh, four in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Dogs have a, a good job of being uh, quite insistent about those kinds of things, but Hey, kind of nice to not need an alarm clock sometimes, I guess. You're right about that. All right. Well, thank you so much for all of this information about this uh, issue or problem. I guess you could maybe call it as well. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. So thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thank you for, for inviting me. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. You'll find a link to today's paper and other resources for this episode in our show notes or on our website. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for show topics, please contact us at podcast at sciencesocieties.org or on Twitter at Field Lab Earth. If you'd like to hear more content like this, please subscribe and don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Stitcher, or anywhere else you find your podcast if you like our show. We are also available on Lyceum, the world's first audio learning community, where you can join our discussion group and comment on each episode. This podcast is a joint production of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America. Special thanks to Lobo Loco for the use of their song Spook Castle on the intro and outro of our show. Opinions and conclusions expressed by authors are their own and are not considered as those of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, Soil Science Society of America, its staff, its members, or its advertisers.